expected direct flow medical transcatheter aortic valve, presented by Dr. Uh, Tusco. His co-authors are Durrani, Schaefers, Viljulic, Colombo, Massiano, DeMarco, Bruschi, and Lefebvre uh, from the uh, Cleveland Clinic, Emory, Hamburg, uh, San Rafael, and uh, Milano, Italy. Great, thank you very much. I'm clearly not Dr. Tuju, uh, even though my last name does spell, start with a T, and I'm, I was born in another country. Um, uh, Vino Thrani, I'll be presenting on behalf of Dr. Tuju and the uh, investigators. He was unable at the last minute to make it uh, to this presentation. These are my disclosures uh, for direct flow, um, as you can see there. So direct flow design is a uh, valve that has been used uh, or will be used for treating aortic stenosis with minimal risk of aortic regurgitation. It shows a double ring design for a tight and durable potential seal. It does uh, conform to anatomy. It has potential optimization for positioning with full hemodynamic assessment before final uh, placement of the valve. It has distal, proximal, and planar uh, reposition ability and is uh, fully retrievable. It's improved uh, potential transcatheter valve procedure in that it's flexible. It's a low profile delivery uh, with reduced vascular complications. It's fully competent uh, during positioning and no post dilation or rapid pacing is required. Uh, it comes with a uh, 18 French sheath and 25 to 27, 25 to 27 valve uh, sizes. Here you can see a, an animation of how the uh, system works. You can see the leaflets are within the system. You can see that it has pistons within the aortic ring and the ventricular ring, uh, which are one-way valves and are able to, as you'll see in a, in a few minutes, a moments, how this works. Transfemorally, the device is brought up, uh, uh, retrograde across the aortic valve, as you can see here, uh, through a sheath. It is unsheathed at this, point, well, at this moment, and the valve is uh, opened. This is originally filled with saline, and so, uh, as you can see here, the valve is manipulated uh, from, the, uh, from the, within the ventricle. You can see here the aortic portion of the ring has been deflated preferentially. The valve is seated nicely underneath uh, the aortic annulus. The ventricular portion uh, is inflated. This is inflated with a uh, saline type of material. Consequently, uh, it is not fixed into position. It has multiple different uh, uh, devices, toggles, which are allowed to uh, position the valve. You can see here with no perivalvular leak, uh, the devices are uh, removed one by one, but before they're done, it is uh, infiltrated with an epoxy, which makes it a permanent uh, fixation of the valve in that configuration. The uh, devices are removed, and you can see that's uh, functional. If for whatever reason you did have someone who had a pair of valve leak, as noted here, you can retrieve the entire valve through the 18 French sheath and place another valve uh, preferentially right uh, to, um, uh, into the aortic annulus. Or you can uh, change the position uh, at your uh, convenience. And of course, you can see here that the valve is working nicely. If you did want to retrieve it, you can see here that, uh, there is a catchment uh, device which is easily able to catch the valve, capture the valve. It is taken from within the sheath and the second valve can be placed. And we'll talk about some of the data uh, for this trial. And you can see a second valve uh, can be implanted at that point. Here is a completed angiogram of a direct flow valve. You can see here the left coronary artery uh, in, uh, illustrated right here. You can see the right um, coronary artery coming on the, uh, obviously the right side. You can see there's minimal perivalve leak and a power injection. The purpose of this study is to report the 30-day and six-month outcomes for the direct flow medical valve under the DISCOVER trial in high-risk patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. The study design for a CE mark study was a multi-center, non-randomized clinical trial from November till uh, uh, 2011 to 2012. It's a core lab adjudicated echo and cath uh, uh, hemodynamics. The committees were patient review, independent CEC and DCMB uh, uh, organizations. Primary endpoint uh, was freedom from all cause mortality from the procedure at 30 days, and it is a uh, secondary endpoints as per the VARC uh, defined. The key inclusion criteria included those patients who were considered a high risk by the heart team. The patients must have a logistic euro score greater than 20 or uh, greater than or equal to 20 in comorbidities. It is, as most of us have seen, for those patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis with a mean gradient greater than 40, or a peak velocity greater than four meters per second and also an AVA less than 0 0.8 or an index less than 0 
the native valve annulus diameter is greater than 19 or less than 26 by the CT scanning. And of course, a heart team decision was uh, agreed upon. These are the uh, seven sites. Uh, the European surgeons were unable to make it to the United States for this presentation, hence uh, I'm uh, uh, per, uh, am doing this on behalf of the sites. There is a, uh, I know this slide may be a little difficult to see, but you can see that uh, here you can see the patient review committee from a variety of European uh, uh, society, uh, organizations, also the clinical events committee. You can see here uh, the, uh, cat, uh, the echo lab was uh, performed mainly by Neil Weissman as the core lab. And you can see the data monitoring committee and also the executive operations committee for the trial. So uh, briefly, the data, the patients are 54 patients. You can see their mean age is 84 uh, with, a mean, uh, with a range of 65 to 94. Uh, it was roughly 50% female, and the Euro score was roughly 23%, and a STS score of about 11%, plus or minus 10. The characteristics for chronic kidney disease, roughly 25% of the patients had this. Peripheral arterial disease, 23%. These were all transfemoral valves. Congestive heart failure in 45% coronary disease in 53, previous cabbage in 14 percent, and atrial fibrillation or flutter in 35 percent. The implanted size valves was 25 millimeter valve in roughly 60 percent of the patients. And earlier in the series, about nine, of, of the earlier series, more 25s were implanted. Later in the series, 27 valves were implanted. The mean diameter of the native valve treated was 23.5, and the minimum di diameter treated for the vessel femoral vessel was 5.2 millimeters. It's currently recommended for a 6 millimeter vessel, but there are some that are uh, flexible enough that a, that a 5.2 millimeter vessel was used uh, for this implantation. For the procedure summary, you can see here the total time from skin to skin is 58 minutes. The pre-BAV dilations are roughly uh, 1.5 per patient. Uh, post dilations were zero. The valve positioning and echo and angiographic assessment was 16 minutes. There were a total of eight patients who had retrieval of the valve and a subsequently a second valve was implanted and rapid pacing was used in zero patients. As you can see here from the Kaplan-Meier curve, there was basically uh, on the x-axis, this goes to uh, 30 days post-procedure. There was one death at post-operative day number 12 due to complications from pneumonia. So there was basically one patient at 30 days for mortality. So when you look at uh, the entire uh, six month time period, I've mentioned the one patient who had death uh, at uh, less than 30 days from a pneumonia. From days 31 to six months, there was an additional death, and that was on day 18. Uh, the patient had pre-existing atrial fibrillation. The patient was uh, not placed on Coumadin therapy, and, and consequently the patient uh, had a stroke earlier than 31 days, but actually died within the 31, to, 31 day to six month time period. At uh, greater than six months, there was an additional death. Uh, and this is a day of 115th with moderate AR post uh, uh, valve implantation who developed right heart failure and consequently died. This is, by the way, the one patient who had moderate aortic insufficiency in the entire trial. So you can see overall it's a 92% mortality uh, at six months. For VART combined device success is roughly 96%. Successful vascular access uh, was obtained in 53 of 54 patients. The valve was deployed uh, uh, without any problems. However, on uh, removing the sheath, the patient did have require two units of blood, which was considered a vascular complication if they received more than two units and consequently was deemed as a, from the VARC classifications, a, um, a delivery problem. Position of the device in proper location was 100%. The intended performance of, you can see the criteria was 53 of 54%. Remember I told you there was one patient who had moderate aortic insufficiency. There was one valve, uh, 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 at, when it says one valve implanted in proper location, that's talking about the valve and valves intraoperatively for uh, a TAVR within a TAVR. Uh, that was not required in any of the patients. So when you look at patient safety, uh, this is combined safety endpoint freedom from any events per patient. It was roughly 90% uh, at 30 days. You can see the all-cause mortality of the one patient that I've mentioned to you already. Uh, there were a total of two patients who had a stroke. Uh, Life-threatening disabling bleeding was two patients. Acute kidney injury in one patient, MI in one patient, same with the vascular complications. Some of these patients are duplicated uh, for, um, uh, to uh, present the data. Pacemakers were roughly in nine patients, and that's a rate of, uh, out of 54 patients, that's a 16.7%. Of note is that the valve was implanted three to six millimeters in the original 
uh, earlier cohorts, and consequently, the, uh, all of the strokes occurred. I mean, all of the pacemakers occurred during that time period, uh, with adjustment of how the valve is positioned more snug up against the uh, aortic annulus from the le uh, left ventricular side. The last 25 patients have had zero pacemakers. This is the NYHA classification. You can see the majority of the patients' uh, baseline, and then uh, at 30 days and six months, uh, were in class one and class two uh, heart failure. The next couple of uh, graphs will be the echo uh, findings. You can see here the mean gradients represented on this slide. This is pre-discharge, 30 days and six months. You can see that the uh, patients had significant uh, aortic, uh, aortic stenosis, and then by six months, the mean gradient is roughly 13.7 uh, millimeters of mercury. At EOAs, you can see here the uh, average EOA was 0.6 square centimeters, and the average at six months is 1.3 square centimeters. On uh, aortic insufficiency, uh, this is total aortic insufficiency. You can see uh, post-procedure, this is at the uh, before discharge of the patients, and this is at six months. You can see that uh, the, there was that one patient that I'd mentioned to you with moderate uh, insufficiency. Uh, the rest were none in trace, and a uh, roughly uh, um, uh, twenty percent of the patients or uh, roughly eighteen percent of the patients had mild with one patient having moderate uh, insuff uh, aortic insufficiency. That one patient, as I'd mentioned to you earlier, did die and at six months uh, with the data that's uh, collected thus far, uh, roughly there's a eighty percent none to trace perivalvular and central aortic insufficiency rate. So in conclusion, the direct flow medical valve can be safely and effectively used to treat high and extreme risk patients with aortic stenosis, which achieved a 98% freedom from all cause mortality at 30 days and 92% at six months. It provides hemodynamic stability during uh, implantation. It does not require rapid pacing. It allows con uh, controlled positioning, repositioning, and potentially safe retrieval if necessary, and it's diminished uh, uh, post-operative aortic insufficiency. So on behalf of the Discover CE trial, I'd like to thank the association for the privilege of the, uh, of the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Microphone number one. Uh, <clears throat> Harold Roberts. Uh, it really uh, looks like a, a, a really nice uh, device. My only uh, um, concern there uh, is the it seems to me like the uh, mean gradients are a little higher than what you normally get uh, with the, uh, um, sir, I'm, my only experience is with uh, Sapien, but those are consistently single digit mean gradients. And uh, I was wondering uh, if you think the design might have uh, some sort of uh, uh, influence on uh, the little bit higher uh, mean gradient. Yeah, Hal, thank you for those uh, comments. I, I, look, I agree with that to, to some extent. We, we looked at it, the, the 25 valve has an AVA of roughly 1.2 to 1.4. The 27 valve has an AVA of roughly 1.4 to 1.7. The data that you saw, for, you saw a little dip between the time periods of 30 days and six months. The majority of the valves, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, were implanted with a 25 valve. And the majority of the patients who haven't come out to completely six months yet are the 27 valves. So I don't expect, we don't expect that really dip that you see from 30 days to six months. The mean gradients, they are what they are. Um, I think that as you see valve areas and mean gradients, I think that they'll hover somewhere as we've seen uh, in, the, in the very low, uh, right above 10 to 12. Um, and I think that that is potentially designed. It's a little bit thicker uh, compared to a sapien valve or a core valve, which has more nitinol or stainless steel or chromium cobalt um, uh, properties to them. So I think the data, this is on, you know, if you notice the six month data is about 18 to 20 patients. That it hasn't come through yet on the core lab. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that, but that's something that I think all of us are looking at. Uh, Wilson Zito, Philadelphia. You know, just, um, of, I noticed eight retrieval. Yep. Uh, more details with a perivalvular leak, coronary occlusion. For me, forgive me if I, didn't, if I missed on the slide set. No, uh, thanks, Wilson. Uh, uh, there were a total of, uh, six, of the, uh, six of the valves were sized up. For instance, they were a 25 was implanted. There was a perivalvular leak. Those patients were the 25 valve was removed safely, as I showed you from the animation, mm -hmm. and a larger valve was implanted. And so consequently, you know, this is, there was a learning curve because it's a new, it's a new disruptive technology compared to what you and I are used to. Mm -hmm. And so when those retrievals were made, a successful valve was implanted, but that's considered a retrieval. So the valve was appreciated, found to be not the right fit, was removed, and a new one was put in. 
as you and I do these, we don't have that option necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I don't consider retrieval as a bad thing, I consider it as an upsizing. There were two patients that actually pulled through, so as they were being adjusted, as you saw from the animation, uh, when you de deflate the aortic portion of the ring, you bring it up and let the ventricular portion of the, of the, uh, of the valve sit up against the annulus, mm -hmm. those can pull through. And early, very early in the series, that did occur by the different toggles that you use. That method and the technique has been altered, so that, that hasn't happened in the last 25 to 30 cases. But I think it's a, a something for us to look at. And a quick technical question. Um, um, the epoxy injection, uh, in terms of timing and retrieval, uh, can you retrieve after the epoxy is injected? No. Okay. That's so, what, so that's with, your commitment point. So once you have saline and you look at your valve and you know that there's no peripheral leak, if you put the epoxy in, that's it. You, you, can't, you can't remove the epoxy. Microphone number four. Uh, Gil Sherlock, Salt Lake. Just an observation. You may or may not know the answer to this. When you look at the ranges of risk of patients who were submitted to the trial, there was a plus minus 10 on the STS and a plus minus 15 on the Euro score, which would put the lower range of patient at 1% STS risk and less than 5 Euro score. And I was curious if this reflected a broadening of indication for operation in the patient groups. So man, that's. Uh, you bring up a good point, and obviously this was a European trial, and um, even though I'm going to, my, uh, Dr. Tuja and I are going to be the national PIs for the trial here, the feasibility trial, I did not implant these, so I did not personally see the patients. So I think it's hard for me to make a comment on that. I think that we have to trust that the Europeans have been doing this for a while. It's a very well-organized or system, and I think the heart team made the decision. Can you just comment again on the incidence of arrhythmias in pacemakers? Were they higher than in the previous TAVR trials? So uh, the previous partner trials and the, the European core valve trials, uh, it falls somewhere in between those two right now. And as far as I can tell, uh, the valve implantation uh, was originally in the, in the whole 54 patient group. It was basically they, the valves initially were implanted three to six millimeters below, where I think we were, they were probably catching the uh, the, the um, conduction system. As that has moved, such that if this is the analyst, the valve sits right up snug up against it. The last 25 patients have been zero pacemaker implants. So I would tell you that it seemed like there was a higher one earlier on, but that seems to have gotten better. Of course, we need more data, uh, you know, Dr. Lazar, to really make a difference or make a uh, definition of what we're going to see long term. Okay, we look forward to hearing it. Thank you very Great. much Thanks. for the session. Thank you.